Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with Chris Jones of Steel Dog Knives. I had the chance to meet Chris and thoroughly pour over his impeccable pieces at the Texas Custom Knife Show in November. Though he had a variety of really cool outdoor and EDC fixed blades on offer, his kitchen knives were, to me, the most compelling. Featuring clean profiles, great cutting geometry, and dazzling handles. He also had one that was uh, traditional Japanese, and it was light as a feather. He makes some really unique graphically themed knives as well. We'll meet Chris. We'll find out about Steel Dog Knives and uh, what he has in store. Uh, but first, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell, download us where you can listen to podcasts. And if you have any uh, interest or capacity, help us on Patreon. Uh, go over there to the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon and see what you get out of the deal. Again, uh, that address is the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Chris, welcome to the Knife Junkie podcast, sir. Good to have you. No, thanks for having me on. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Uh, your booth at the Texas Custom Knife Show was one uh, I came back to numerous times, and uh, I had uh, I had a great time talking to you about the knives, and and you told me about some of your, um, you know, some of your background, and it's very interesting uh, to me. Your knives, as I mentioned up front, um, you seem to be specializing right now in these uh, gorgeous kitchen knives uh but uh tell me what tell me about steel dog knives to begin with how did you get into knives and how did you start actually making them yeah it's uh it's kind of an interesting story i um it's it's a unique one that i don't know that anybody else has um about six years ago i had um, an emergency appendectomy had to go in i'd had a, some outpatient procedure a week or two before had an emergency appendectomy go into the hospital um have the surgery had some complications from the surgery and ended up in the hospital for five days and as i'm laying there in my hospital bed i don't want to be on my ipad i don't want to be on my phone i just i'm just going to watch the tv that's there um in the actual uh, hospital room and you know you got the little speaker next to you and i stumble upon a forge and fire marathon and i was like this is I'm hooked, right? Like, this is fascinating. And it helped get me through um, that time that I was in the hospital. And then uh, when I got home, I continued to watch it and became fascinated by the show and then go down some rabbit holes of YouTube and told myself, you know, when I get healthy again, like, I, I want to try this. And um, so I did. And, and I wasn't as fascinated with the, um, honestly, with, with swinging a hammer, right. And an anvil. I mean, that, that part is cool. I do enjoy doing that sometimes. Um, but it was, um, just the being able to make something right. Um, I used to do some woodworking and really enjoyed it. And so getting into this and, and getting into the knives. And so I made my first two knives, um, with a hand filing jig. Hmm. And so I, um, I always tell people like make a hand filing jig and make, don't make one knife, make two. Because anybody can make one knife with a hand filing jig of you know three to six hours per side filing these down. And but if, if you make two and you still enjoy it, then go invest in some equipment. And so I started to do that, started making some some knives. And um, um one day my wife asked me um to make a kitchen knife. And I never made a kitchen knife. <clears throat> I'm not a big hunter. Um I do camp, I do backpack, so I have some um um, use of with knives from that, but uh, I grew up in a kitchen. My dad managed restaurants. And so hmm. I, um, was like, well, I can do this and, and made my first kitchen knife and it's absolutely terrible. Um, I didn't understand. I approached it the same way that I would approach, um, a camp knife, right. Um, or an EDC. And it, it really is different, um, having to focus on the, the geometry. And, and so, um, I was like, man, I, there's no way I'm ever going to get somebody to buy a knife when they can go down to Walmart and buy a $15 cheap knife that, that worked better. And it was because of the geometry. And so I kind of poured myself into it and um, 
started doing some, some research and, and, you know, watching different makers, um, people like Mareko Malmasi, um, uh, Salem Straub, Don Wynn, um, guys that make just beautiful chef knives and, and learning anything I could um, from their YouTube channels, from their Instagram, and um, just kind of went from there and, and stayed with it. And once I got a couple that worked, um, I was like, this is definitely the way I want to go. So I still do the occasional camp knife. Um, I mean, I'm working on a, a batch of four. Um, here, these are kind of cool. This is for a former coworker of mine. Um, he's got some, uh, antique cherry that his grandfather harvested 70 years ago. That's been oh, man. crying in a, in a <laughs> uh, barn for, for years. And you know, it, it, it has some really cool figure to it. That's so I'm beautiful. keeping it nice and matte. I told him I'm going to make a, make him a knife that looks like he could have bought it out of a Sears catalog. Right. Back when his grandfather, back in the, day. Yeah, so yeah. Back in the day, it's got brass, uh, brass pins on it we're going to go with a old school looking uh leather sheath and um so i still do some of that i still do some edcs but i really really do love um the kitchen knives um and it's, it's kind of become uh, my thing and um won a couple of awards and um put my knives in the hands of professional chefs and and they really enjoy it and they give me good feedback and so yeah that's just the way that um the direction i've taken over the last probably Two, two and a half years. All right. I, I want to follow the path uh, to get there, but I want to go back to the hospital. Sorry. Uh, yeah, no, definitely. I, I can ramble on. So my, you know, oh, no, no, uh, I, I want to, as long as out... I start at the beginning, my wife will tell me I just sometimes start in the middle of a story. So, um, but yeah, uh, definitely. We can go back to the hospital. Yeah. Well, it, it, to me, it's, it's interesting because uh, forged in fire does not have to be, uh, there's a there's a certain kind of show. It's the reality competition creative show. Uh, there are a lot mm -hmm. of uh, cooking shows like that, uh, fashion shows. I like them all. Uh, you know, I haven't seen them all, but you put me in front of any one of them, I'm going to like it. And that's kind of uh, people like me who don't love knives see Forged in Fire and it and and it ignites something. Uh, sorry for the pun. Uh, what was it lying in that hospital bed that? Uh, that awakened this interest in you um you said you liked building stuff but you know uh if you had turned down orange city chopper or orange county choppers would you be building bikes right now maybe no, maybe not no because no because i watched orange county choppers and i didn't go build bikes um i love watching um uh, you know the 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 different car shows, you know, the ones that some of the ones that Netflix have like uh, you know, rust to riches and, and stuff like that. Rust Valley restores. I love watching those, but I don't restore cars. Um, but I, I grew up kind of watching the old, um, you know, this old house, Norm Abram, the woodworking stuff. And I always really enjoyed that. And I did a lot of woodworking and, and built a lot of furniture. Our current kitchen table and chairs is something that I've built, but it was just something about, the knives that I really don't know that I can, um, you know, pinpoint it. I mean, I, I think a lot of us are always fascinated by sharp things. Right. Um, mm -hmm. and you know, it's, it's, um, there, there's something about, you know, being able to use a, a, a great knife. And, but I, I think the one thing that, that I really liked was it was something that was, it was obtainable. It was realistic. Right. I mean, yes, I had to invest in equipment over the years. Right. I mean, I'm surrounded here by, um, equipment, that I've purchased, but in the beginning I could do it relatively small and I could express my creative side, right. With the, with the handle specifically. Um, I, I like to, to, you know, pick things and, and, and pick colors maybe that are, that are bold and still do some of the traditional, but I, I like to do different things with, with handles. And I've got some uh, great um, suppliers that uh, provide me with some cool stuff and we've collaborated on a number of things, but to me, the handle is the character of the knife, right? I want something that has that character. And I like to talk to folks about <clears throat> making the knife special to them, right? And, and having that. Um, I recently posted um, this week a, um, a chef knife that I was, uh, I was honored to have uh, given, be given the opportunity to make. Um, someone approached me and they wanted to make a knife to honor the memory of their daughter. Mm. who passed away um, unexpectedly a couple of years ago. And so as I'm going back and forth and asking them some questions about, well, what was it her favorite thing to do or, or what was, um, 
know, what, what was something special to her? The, the mom mentioned that her favorite color was electric turquoise. Hmm. And I thought to myself, okay, electric turquoise, I can work with that. And so I made um, this knife. I'll show it here. Uh, this chef knife. It's for oh, a, um, it's for um, her daughter's partner um, who is a chef um, in Denver, I believe. And so it's, I went with high carbon, did a, um, um, a stone wash finish, but worked with um, Sarah uh, from um, oh, yeah. Swikowski scales um, and, um, or scales by Sarah depends upon which uh, platform she's on. And we made some, uh, this is from uh, dank blanks. So um, Jordan Danks and um, it's a resin. And so it's, it's really cool. It's got that turquoise. It's got something that's special to them. And that's what I love uh, about it. So to go back and answer your question, I, I think what, what really was is I, I could create something unique and I could create something where I could put my personality and my um, style and my creativity into it and do it, you know, reasonably. Uh, it's interesting because uh, woodworking, uh, you're, you're also making something in something that is uh, incredibly useful, um, incredibly uh, 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 long lasting and, and um, you know, you said it was a kitchen table and chairs that a family sits around. That's going to be a durable, a durable good. But something about knives in uh, being a tool that you can use to do other things, make other tools uh, and do all sorts of, you know, feed yourself basically. Uh, and then the portability of it and how many more you can make and actually sell and move and, you know, to go to a furniture show. And, and I'm sure this has very little or nothing to do with the calculus and why, why you got obsessed with knives. But it's interesting to think about a woodworker slash knife maker. One thing you can make a bunch of and then take them to a show and sell them. Another thing is, is big, hard to move. Um, I don't know. Yeah, si it's, similar it's, process. It's yeah, it's not things that I, I, you know, did in the beginning or that I thought of in the beginning of, you know, oh, well, let's do this because, you know, they are smaller, easier to move. You know, I could probably sell them faster. Like to me, when I first started making, it wasn't about selling. Um, you know, I, I probably gave away every knife that I made for close to the first year. Um, one of my, um, um, my, my best friend, Adam, who's at the, the, the show, he's at almost every show um, that I'm at. He carries one of the first knives that I ever actually made off of a commission. And I, I asked him not to show anybody <laughs> anymore because it was uh, early days and it's pretty rough, but um, he loves that knife. Um, he cherishes that knife and um, keeps it in his truck with him. And so I, I think that's the key word though, is I, I, I love being able to build something that people will cherish, right? I want something that people want to show off. Um, and when you look at, you know, like you said, you, with knives, you can use it to make other things. And with chef knives, you're making meals, you're making food. And what is centered around food? It's, it's typically it's bringing family together, right? And family's important to me. And I remember, you know, thinking back, I thought about this, you know, uh, probably a couple of years ago, my, my grandmother who passed away, um, a few years, or you know, probably about uh, five, six years back. She, uh, before I started making knives, um, we used to always get together at her house for Thanksgiving and Christmas. And, um, she would make meals. And I remember she used what now I, it was like probably the worst knife, you know, these, these old broken down knives. She came from a time where she went through the depression. And so she just used yeah. a knife for years that was dull and chipped and the handle wasn't great. And, you know, I, I wish I could have given her something that, that, that she could have um, cherished and, and used. But um, I think, yeah, that, that's the beauty of you use chef knives to make food and make meals and meals bring families and friends together. And so I, I think that's probably why I gravitated towards it. So uh, let me ask you this as a knife maker who, um, who makes really beautiful kitchen knives for that purpose, that purpose of feeding families and that, that sort of, it's a sacred purpose really. Uh, but I would argue that most knives fulfill that role in some way or another, but especially, uh, kitchen knives. Uh, it, 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 are you conflicted knowing or, or, or with the, with the possibility that people buy your knives and they're so nice that they don't use them? Do you know what I mean? And they end up being, yeah, no, I, I, yeah, I, I know what you mean. Um, 
I, I think with um I think with with hunting knives, camp knives, stuff like that, um, you know, art pieces, art knives that, that people make, I think there's more of a tendency for that. Um, I think with kitchen knives and um I would like to think that my customers use them. Um, I get a lot of feedback from them that they, you know, how much, how great it is, how, how sharp it is, how much they love to use it. Um, and so that leads me to believe that most of the things that I'm making, people are using. Um, I have made some that I know for a fact that, you know, they've never been used and they probably won't be used. Um, but maybe they'll get handed down someday and somebody will use them. Um, but um, yeah, it's, I, I want folks to, to, to use my knives. I, I love looking back on, you know, when somebody brings me a knife and um, that I've made. And I always tell people that, you know, I'll resharpen any knife that I make for free for the life of me or the life of the knife. And, um, you know, it's, uh, they send it back to me and, and I'll clean it up a little bit. Um, I'll, I'll maybe clean up the handle. I'll resharpen it, give it a little spa day, right? Mm -hmm. um, and be able to send it back to them. Um, and so I tell them, I was like, don't worry about it. If you, if you do so, if you accidentally drop it and you break uh, the tip off, your eight inch chef knife will become a seven and a half inch chef <laughs> knife because you send yeah. it back to me and I'll, I'll reprofile it. I'll fix it. Um, so I, it's, it's, I, I want people to use it. Right. Um, and um, so, yeah, I, I hope they are using it, but I understand, you know, some of these knives can get kind of pricey. So, you know, some people may want to, uh, to show them off, but if they're being displayed and they're still showing people off and people are proud of it and they still cherish it in their own way. Yeah. That's okay. Right. Yeah, that's, what that's I would hate would be to make a knife and have it just live in a drawer and nobody ever sees it. Yeah. That that's exactly, I, I am a collector. I have way more knives than I will ever use. Uh, but that's, that's part of my pride of ownership is showing them off. And, and that's part of like why I have a show and all that kind of stuff. Uh, cause I get to show them off sometimes. Um, but uh, the process of making a knife. First, I want to I want to find out about your process of making a knife and how it changed once you got to kitchen knives. But before I get there and before you answer, that, I have to say it must be cool to have those spa day experiences where you see a knife coming back and just kind of uh, you know look at it and see. You know, when I sent this out, it was a totally smooth handle. Now there are dings in it from use and. Um, and you can see how the blade has changed and uh, that's gotta be kind of cool. It is. It's, you can see the, you can see the scuff marks, you know, on the blade, um, where they put it in the knife block or they put it on a magnetic board. Um, you know, if it's high carbon, you can see all that patina. Yeah, I, I love that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the handle may have dulled a little bit, maybe, you know, sometimes with, with, um, custom knives and, and a lot of times they're given as gifts. Um, some people don't realize the the, the care um, that's needed, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and it's 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 not a lot, but you know, obviously, never in the dishwasher. Um, but one recently that I never thought of telling people um, is don't let it soak in, you know, water really, especially hot water, for yeah. any period of time, right? It's like they had something, they were doing some dishes, they threw it down in the sink, it soaked for, you know, maybe 10, 20 minutes. Um, bring it back out, and it'll kind of pop the grain, and the water was really, really hot, and so. Um, it did cause a little bit of the handle um, to, to, to pop off. Um, but they sent it back and I fixed it. Um, right, and I was right. actually able to salvage that same handle. Um, and um, I'm actually giving it back to them this week. So, hmm. yeah, I, I want to be able to see it. I want to see it a little beat up, right? I don't want to yeah. see, um, you know, where it was abused. Um, but, um, yeah, I want to see a little bit of use on it when I see it again. So uh, kitchen knife geometry, we all know it's, it's gotta be very thin. It, it, it mm -hmm. takes some skill to get there. So tell us about your process and, and what it was like kind of getting to the point where you could do that sort of full flat grind so thin and be successful at kitchen knives. Well, a lot of it came with equipment. Um, when I first, um, started making, uh, kitchen knives, I was still using a, you know, a two by 42 um grinder that had, was a one-third horsepower and has um i used to call it the dremel of grinders because it made up for what it lacked in power by going a million miles an hour um and that's not something that you can do a chef knife on very easily um because it takes you need to be able to slow it down you need to be able to have a vfd um and so some some of the equipment um really helped 
um, learning to not, um, you know, to use uh, fresh belts all the time. Um, I think it was an expression. I think Jason Knight once said, and if I, it was somebody else, you know, I apologize, but I, I, I think I remember it was Jason Knight said, use belts like you own the belt manufacturing company. <laughs> right. right. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, easy for him to say, because I think he's probably sponsored by somebody, um, but I'm not. So I'm, I'm using all of mine, but, you know, using fresh belts and, and really just pushing yourself, um, you know, thinking, can I get that thinner? Yes. Yes, you can. Um, and I think the first time that I got a knife down to pretty much a zero edge, um, I realized like how much more time and effort that it took and how much patience um, it took to get there, but ultimately it was going to make for um, a better knife. And, um, you know, up until oh, sometime last year, I was trying to take all of my chef knives down to 10 thousandths of an inch. Hmm. And I talked to um, another um, knife maker. He does folders now, um, but he's been a knife maker for 30 years. And he goes, nah, he goes, you can get it down to five thousandths. No. Like, really? And he's like, yeah. And so he challenged me. And so I, you know, the last, um, you know, every knife I've made now for the last uh, three, four months has been five thousandths instead of ten thousandths. And I got to admit, it's kind of cool to, I made one right before Christmas and, um, for a friend of mine and had him come over, he was giving it to his wife and I was like, Hey, check this out. And I pulled a stalk of celery out and I just start cutting and he's like, okay, great. And I was like, I haven't sharpened it yet. Oh, yes. Like I'm just slicing yeah. off little thin pieces of celery. And he's like, wait, what? And I'm like, yeah, it's 5,007 inch. Like I have not put that sharpening bevel on there. Um, and it, it, it felt like a knife that was, that needed to be sharpened, right. was a little bit on the dull side, but it was mm -hmm. still usable. Yeah. Um, and so then it's okay. If now, if I can put the edge on it, now it's really going to provide the performance that somebody's Pro looking for. Probably without the edge, it was sharper than 98% of the blades in kitchens of America, you know? Oh, definitely. And, and that includes some, I'm, well, I'm going to say professional kitchens. If you've got a, you know, a head chef, right. Um, and you've got somebody in there that, that can teach and they're, they're resharpening their knives, um, on a regular basis. If, if you're just in a restaurant with a kitchen and a head cook and, you know, somebody that's prepping the food, I've been in some of those kitchens and those knives aren't very sharp. Um, but yes, I know that they're dull in most kitchens because one of the things I offer for, I offer sharpening services for, for people locally. Um, and I do a lot for folks in my neighborhood and they'll bring me, you know, their Wustoffs or Jay Hinkles or, um, you know, they're, they're, they're different knives that they got at Bed Bath & Beyond or, or mm -hmm. Target or wherever. And I'll resharpen them. And, um, yeah, most of them are extremely dull. Um, and, you know, that just doesn't make for a good cutting experience and it, it doesn't make for a good cooking experience. And, you know, I, I want them to to take those, go back home and realize, wow, this was, this was phenomenal. Um, and it's, you know, hey, you invest in your knives, even the knives that you were, you know, you might, you know, buy um, at like a William Sonoma or something. You, you invested something in those knives, spend the time to either learn yeah. how to sharpen or find somebody that can sharpen them. Well, I mean, you know, talking about geometry uh, and you mentioned Vostoff, I have a, I have a big 10 inch trident that I've had for years and I love that knife. Uh, but ever since I got uh, my first custom kitchen knife that's real thin and ground real thin, um, when I when I have occasion to use it, it feels like an axe at this point. You know, it's like a much thicker stock, a much more oblique grind, even though it's a pretty broad blade. But there's just not enough room, you know, uh, north to right. south for that to thin out enough. So. Uh, I, I think oftentimes companies are building them to be super robust, you know, oh, more, than, more you know, than thin. Yeah. I, I tell folks when, when somebody comes up to my table, it's one of my favorite things when somebody comes up and says, why should I buy this knife instead of, you know, going and getting, you know, a, um, a, 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 even not a shun, but, you know, maybe something like a, a Wustoff or a Hinkles. Right. Mm -hmm. And I, I tell them, I was like, well, if you think about, I was like, one, if you ever have any problems, you can reach out to me. You don't have to call an 800 number. Okay. Yeah. Um, two, we can customize for your taste and you don't have that generic black handle. 
Um, but really what it, you know, I ask them is, is like, have you ever accidentally dropped your chef knife or you threw it in the sink or did something and the tip bent? And most people go, oh yeah. I was like, and what did you do? Like, well, I took it and I put it back on the cutting board and I kind of bent it back. I was like, hardened steel shouldn't bend. That's not the way a chef knife should work, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so if you think about it, if it's bending, it's not going to have the properties that it needs to hold an edge very well. Um, and I said, but if you think about the, these companies that are doing that, it's like I said, you bend it back. I said, but if you did something and the tip of your knife broke off, what would you do? And like, well, I'd probably call, you know, Hinkles or Wustoff and ask for a replacement, you know, what's under warranty and do something. I was like, right. So they don't want you to do that. So they're going to give you one um, that, um, you know, it's, it's typically the Rockwell hardness. I haven't tested them myself, but I think the Rockwell hardness on those production grade knives is, is typically a little bit lower, maybe somewhere in like the mid fifties. Um, I try to target 60, 61 with mine and I've had mine tested. Um, nice. And, um, it, you know, so it's, yes, if you drop mine, the tip might break, but that is because of, um, you know, some of that hardness. But if you've seen some of the videos that I have out on, um, my Instagram or my Facebook, I have some fillet knives that I can flex pretty significantly. Yeah. You showed um, me, and, uh, at the show you, you demonstrated that. So uh, tell me how you make them. The, the fillet it. knives? No, no. Describe um, your process. Oh, just, describe all. Yeah, so just my, in general. Yeah. So my process typically, I do a lot of stock removal um, because I work with a lot of stainless. And so typically, my process is is I'm going to take a stainless blank. I try to work with as thin of a material that I can get by with, right, to where it's still functional. So for a chef knife, I'm typically doing three thirty seconds inch stock. Um, AEBL or Nitro V is, is typically my go-tos. And, um, you know, I'll sit there and I'll, I'll, I'll draw out, I'll come up with something. I've got templates then I'll, I'll make it out of wood first, not put the bevels on, but just kind of to get the look and the feel and, and grip it and hold it and say, Hey, does this work? And that then becomes a template. Um, then I'll take it and I'll put some layout fluid on, um, that and, and I'll cut it out. So this is a blank, right? So it's full thickness here, three thirty seconds. Um, so I'll get this, I'll cut it out on the, the, the porta band. Um, obviously I had an accident back in December. If anybody saw my Instagram, I almost cut the tip of my thumb off. Um, <clears throat> safety with a porta band, please. Um, always use push sticks. <laughs> um, but I got in a hurry, drill my holes, get all of this. Um, and then I actually will take this and, um, you know, wrap it in foil, put it in the, the kiln and I'll heat treat it. And I heat treat at full thickness on all my chef knives. Um, and that, you know, helps minimize some of the warps. And then I'll come back, scribe oh. some lines, and then I'll come in and, and grind. And so when I'm grinding, I'm typically grinding, you know, the flats to get up this way to help get, you know, that, that geometry. But I'm also grinding in a distal taper, right? So if we see this one and we see full thickness, this is the spine going all the way down here. And we compare that to a chef knife. And there's some glare there, so it doesn't really want to show. But it definitely gets thinner and thinner and thinner and thinner as we get to the end. Right. Yeah. Um, looking down the and, spine towards the tip. Yep. Yep. And so we want that distal taper going all the way towards the tip. You don't want a big chunky um, tip and um, you, you want to be able to get your full flat grinds um, pretty high. Um, so you'll see, <clears throat> you know, I, I see a lot of guys that, that make um, camp knives and, and, and hunters and EDCs and they do them. They're phenomenal. They do them really well, but they'll come in and they'll do, their grinds will be too low and it'll come all the way out here and they'll have a real um, too thick of a tip. And that's going to cause a knife. That's a little bit that that's going to be too heavy. Um, it's going to have more of that obtuse geometry. And as you go to cut things, um, one of the things that I like to, to, to test on is baby carrots. If you're cutting a baby carrot and you get about halfway through the baby carrot and it snaps, then you know that your geometry is not there, right? You want to be able to slice little pieces off the end of a baby carrot. Um, but yeah, I'll grind that bevel in. Um, I typically do a nice belt finish on mine because it helps with the cleanup later when somebody wants to send it back, I can clean that up. Um, then slap the handle scales on there, you know, drill the holes, glue it up, shape the handle, um, and then come back and, and sharpen it. 
So uh, grinding it full width um, after it's been heat treated, obviously, uh, that's one of those cases where you have to use a lot of discipline and use all your belts, kind of like uh, oh, definitely, uh, yeah, Jay was it's, saying because it's, it's a lot tougher, right? Yeah, the the materials it, it's hardened at that point, right? Yeah. Um, a lot of times, it's like when I'm making this this camp knife, I actually ground some of these bevels in um, ahead of time, um, get the edge down to the thickness of a dime, um, but it's difficult to do that with a chef knife because especially for stainless, because when I'm heat treating it, I pull it out of the kiln and I actually quench between two aluminum plates. And so if it's not full thickness and it does have that bevel in there, it's going to have a tendency to want to warp or, or, or wiggle and you get that bacon edge, right? Where it's not so much just like a banana warp, but you might see this little wiggle in there and now you have to grind that out and you don't have as much room to play with. Yeah. Um, and also with that that taper, right? You you can't put that distal taper in ahead of time. So, no, you have to use um, fresh belts. Um, you know, I go with a thirty six grit um, when I start thirty six grit uh, ceramic, and um, I actually do when I'm uh, I've gotten comfortable enough with it now. I'll go one hundred percent on my VFD when I'm first starting. Wait, wait, what's um, that mean? That I'm going full speed on that variable speed drive. On okay. my grinder, like it's to hog off it's, material, as they say. Yes, and and that's the great. Um, you got to be careful. Uh, you know, that's a great way to get what we call a knife makers manicure, or what I call a knife makers <laughs> manicure, where you uh, lose thumbprints, um, and you get little you know spots on your fingers where you touch a thirty six grip belt that's going oh, full speed. But God. do that to kind of set the angle and and get it in with a with a worn belt at first. Um, when, when grinding, cause I don't want, if I've got that sharp edge right on this edge, I don't want to take and knock off all the abrasives. Right. So I'm oh, going a worn belt oh, and I'm God. coming back in with a sharp belt and I'm setting that grind to maybe about right here. Right. Just about a quarter inch, you know, um, maybe three quarters of an inch, um, uh, depending upon the, the knife and the, the, the height of the heel. Right. But I'm just kind of setting that somewhere in here, less than an inch all the way out. And then I um, will then start um, to take it up higher and higher. And I'll show you here, actually, oh, it's a good thing I'm sitting at my desk. I have a Sharpie marker, um, which, by the way, for anybody that um, is, it does this on a regular basis, ditch the Sharpies and go to the Milwaukee's. Um, I'm not sponsored yet, but um, would love to be. Um, but these things work so much better on steel where you've got a little bit of grime. Maybe you're, you know, it's, if it's, if it's a little dusty, if it's, it works a lot better than the Sharpies. Huh. But I'll kind of show you on here what I'm trying to grind off. Right. So if you think of a normal knife right here and you think of that plunge line and coming up here, when I'm grinding a chef knife, <clears throat> this is that top line. Right. So here, that top line, that full flat, that bevel's coming right across here. Oh, I got you. On a chef yeah. knife, it's coming up here. Right. So if you think about extending that up all the way out here, what I'm doing is by doing that, I'm actually adding that distal taper. Oh, here. I see. So yes. I'm bringing that grind up here and then all the way out. So I'm spending a lot of time grinding material out here and less time grinding right here. Hmm. Right. But but you're always yeah. doing it as if uh, you're working on it uh, on a larger piece, flat. Uh, it's hard to explain, yeah, but I, I get what you mean once you drew that on there. Yeah, yeah. And and you work in sections, right? So I'll work in here and I'll get that line and then I'll start to, you know, and I'll get it up to where I want it. Then I'll start moving it farther and farther out, right? And get it even and then I'll come back. And by the end of it, you've created a flat that's, you know, there's not a lot of facets in there. It's, it's, you can almost do it with your eyes closed, right? You can just lay it up against the, um, the belt and, and you know exactly where that flat is and then you can grind. Um, feel it's your, it's, it's, so much. it's, it's feel. Yeah. And, and it's, it takes, I, I, I tell people when, when I'm approaching the grinder, I go in with a pretty loose grip, right? Um, so I've got it, it's in my hands and I can kind of barely set it on the, the belt right here and then once i get it and once i find the flat so i've got the mm -hmm. edge uh, let's see how i can do that in here i've got the edge and it's like okay i can find the flat find the fl okay i found the flat right now i can kind of tighten my grip a little bit and work my bevels back and forth 
With chef knives, I have a long platen on mine. So I actually also like to work a lot this way, hmm. right? Because more of the knife is in contact with the platen at that given time. So it's, that, it's easier yeah. to kind of maintain that flat. That, that, that uh, really uh, explains well uh, how you get that distal taper with, with a grinder. Like I sort of understand it if you're pounding it out uh, with a, you know, if you're forging a blade, it's sort of intuitive. Yeah, if you're forging it, it it's but... totally, totally different. Like here's yeah. one that, you know, I, I forged out, right? Um, Ooh, and this was cool beautiful. when I did this one. It was a collaboration with um, um, uh sugar or it sugarfield uh distillery in uh, louisiana oh, nice. and this is a piece of their um oak barrel oh, man. right uh one of their whiskey barrels and so that we had stabilized but yeah i'm hammering it out and i'm hammering that you know as it gets thinner and thinner and thinner out towards the tip i hammer that in right but you're not doing that on um stainless and so you know one of the things that i do is i come in and i scribe a center line here and then I'll scribe a center line on the spine. And then, like I said, I'll knock the edges off. And then sometimes I'll even knock the top off. This is something I learned from Don Wins on his videos. I'll knock the top off. So I'll, I'll kind of take full thickness here out to about the midway point in the tip. And so then that'll create almost like a false edge, hmm. right? Like a swell, oh, yeah. a secondary bevel on the top. So now I've created a bevel on the top, I've created a bevel on the bottom. Um, those go to, you know, my center line. And after that, it's, it's like going back to kindergarten and just coloring between the lines, right? I've created the lines. And I think I heard this one from Salem Straub. Um, again, if I get the quote wrong, I apologize. But it's my grinder is the crayon. My grinder is the marker. And I'm, I'm coloring between the lines. When I heard that, it's like this light bulb went off in my head. And that made me so much better at grinding. Um, it's so simple, but it's like, okay, yeah, that's the line. You know, this is the line I'm following. This is the line on the edge. Use the grinder to remove the material in between. All right. So this is interesting to me because obviously you get better at grinding through the physical practice, the practical practice. Yeah, absolutely, of, yes. Uh, but but it's interesting how, um, uh, you know, hearing a phrase could also translate into better grinding what's your mindset like when you're making a knife versus when you're doing um you have another uh job right this is not your full-time profession at the moment correct yes so so what what's the mindset uh, <clears throat> difference like between those two worlds it's it's different and it's the same um so for my for my day job i um i work for JetBlue airways and I'm the manager of business intelligence. So I work in data and analytics. So very analytical thinking. Um, and my team is responsible for um, the educating um, our users in the analytics products that we use and growing that community. So it's a lot of working with other people, um, you know, uh, building their proficiencies, growing that community. The knife community, there's similarities in the knife community as well. And that, you know, what I hope by doing this and anybody can reach out to me with questions is I want to grow the proficiency of the knife community, right? And I want to grow the knife community. I want to sharing ideas. But when I'm going in and I'm, I'm, I'm grinding, it's, it is kind of heads down, you know, um, trying to focus. I, I do have ADHD. So, you know, one of the superpowers of those of us with ADHD, if you can harness it, is hyper focus. And so it's get the music that puts you in the right mood and hyper focus and just focus on, you know, that, that grinding and try to eliminate um, the distractions. And I try to do it. I try to do each knife, at least get those bevels in one session. Right. Um, so I try not to stop and then come back to it. I want to stay in that mindset um, because you really have to be, you have to think about your posture. You got to think about your, your form, you, you got to, you know, it, it, all that kind of becomes second nature um, after a while, but you, you want to be like, okay, I'm in the mindset now of grinding, right? I'm not trying to do anything else. I'm not grinding here for a little bit, going over and doing something else. It's hmm. like, I'm going to grind the bevels on this knife and I'm going to get them. And sometimes I'll do half a dozen at a time. That's what I was going to ask you. Is this, uh, when you 
uh, how do you batch them? Are they small batches? And and when you're doing them, are you uh, doing all? Uh, presumably, you would. I mean, it'd be foolish kind of not to. But you're doing all the handles at the same time, all the bevels at the same time, all yes. the sharp. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, um, it's um I have some limitations. Um, like when it comes to the heat treat, I can only really do about six at a time because I only have two sets of quench plates. Um, so when I'm doing heat treat, when I'm doing bevels, I'll do six, right? And then I may get those knives and I may go back and do heat treat and bevels. Um, this last set of um I probably shaped and formed twelve to fourteen handles in 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 a batch. Right. Um, cause it's it, again, with the handles, it's kind of going through this repetition and this mindset. And what I found was I became much more efficient and cut down on my production time significantly, um, by doing batches. Right. Um, if, if I have to do a knife from end to end, start to finish and don't stop and, and work on any other knife, um, I wouldn't make very many knives. Um, but I, I, yeah, I try to do them in, in groups of, uh, four to six. So, uh, before we started rolling, I requested, uh, you grab a couple of blades. Let's, let's take a look at those. Uh, these, yeah. uh, at the, at the <laughs> knife show, these really caught my eye and I, and I swear I had seen them somewhere like, uh, but I didn't, I, I guess I hadn't. I asked if they were on the cover of Blade magazine. You're like, no. And they, they look no, like they should I, be. The way you had it set I've, up there, it was it was really cool. Yeah, I've, I've never made it into a magazine. I've had professional photos taken um, and I, I haven't made it in. And yeah, you know, okay, that's fine. Um, but um, I am going to Blade Show Texas here in a couple of weeks. That'll be my first uh, Blade Show. Um, but yeah, I've got a couple um, here. I can, um, let's see. So this one, is a favorite of mine. Um, this is a, I love Nikiri's. I use a push stroke um, when, when using knives. And it's something that I, I ask a lot of customers when they're trying to, you know, determine what type of knife, which, which knife should I get? Um, I ask them, you know, how do you grip a knife? Are you using a pinch grip? Are you, you know, holding it back here, maybe with your thumb on the spine? Do you use a lot of rocking motion or do you use a lot of push motion? Um, <clears throat> and so I can kind of put them in a knife that, that fits them right if they're using a pinch grip they can get by with a little bit longer knife because they're closer to the tip um but this is a, a nikiri it's um some high polished damascus i don't normally do high polished damascus most of the time my if i'm doing damascus it's it's a, a darker oh, uh, God, contrast beautiful um this one won uh, so the the show that that we were at that uh you know texas uh, custom knife show um this one best kitchen knife in 2022. Yeah, nice. Somehow I still have it. I cannot believe that no people pick it up. <laughs> um, funny story on this one is is um, I showed it. Uh, I was talking to Doug Markaita, you know, and he was there and and he had told me he's like, oh yeah, I voted for that knife. And um, he said Jay Nielsen had picked it up and and, and Jay made a comment about the handle's too skinny. And, and Doug's like, well, it's a chef knife. Jay, you're not supposed to hold it like this. It's not a chopper. <laughs> He's like, yeah. it's, it's here, right? And and this thing is so light and 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 balanced really well. Um, but that's what I would typically do um, on Damascus. This is um, Alabama Damascus, and um, this one's also Alabama Damascus. But it's I, I polished it out. Um, same pattern, raindrop. And this one I I did a wah handle, and so this one has some um, horn beam, um, some true stone, and then this was um, a piece of koa. I absolutely mm. love Koa. Um, and this one, um, best uh, culinary knife, uh, best kitchen knife at the Lost Pine Show in Bastrop um, earlier back in, what was that, September. Um, so I, I really love this one. I don't do a lot of wah handles, um, but I, I really do um, enjoy them. Those um, are octagonal, me, right? Octagonal. Yeah, the, oct the octagonal, you know, handle, um, yeah. the, the traditional Japanese um you know style handle they're a little longer than what you would see in a western knife um but this one was was much more traditional i did another um wah handle and i think this was the one you were referencing earlier when you're talking about how um light it how was light it was yeah. um this is uh, stainless damascus from dama works and i wanted to do something that i'd never seen before so i don't know if it's, it's kind of difficult to see but that is hand engraving 
um, by another knife maker here um, locally to me in Tomball. His name's Phil Dunn. He does a lot of uh, folders and he hand engraved that. And I wanted to do something that was kind of a mix between traditional Japanese, but also maybe some more like um, Western style. And I, there's like a Southwest influence in here with yeah. some turquoise true stone and some um, engraving. And then, you know, most of the time when I'm doing um, one of these, I'll also, you know, make a, a Saya for it. So a nice tight friction fit Saya um, with similar material. Um, but yeah, these were, um, these are some that I, like I said, I really enjoy doing, but um, I don't do them super often. Um, some of the other things, this would be more of just my standard um, chef knife mm, um, again with Koa. Um, and so this is something, um, you know, like I said, I, I like more of an aggressive, um, you know, point. Some people look at it and think the point's too low, but it actually works um, where it is, and, you know, on the handle on a Western style knife. Uh, the tip is typically on the center of the handle or, or towards the top. Um, and so this one works really well with a pinch grip um, or with a traditional grip. Um, and um, yeah, I try to round off all of my spines right here. That was feedback I got from a chef one time um, so that it doesn't create a hot spot. Oh. Um, but yeah, it's, um, but I like to do, you know, some fun stuff too. This is one that I just finished this week. I haven't posted it yet, so we'll get a Ooh. preview here. This is a, a new design for me. It's a very aggressive tip. Um, this is much more for a push cut style, um, than you would a, a rock. It's got a little bit of rock to it. Um, but it also has, um, the handle kicks up a little bit. So you get a little more knuckle clearance. Um, and this is Juma again with some dank blanks, uh, resin. So I call this one fire and ice. Fire. Um, that's, but that's really yeah, nice. this one's this, like I said, this one works really well for me because I like to do a push cut. Yeah, that blade um, profile is really cool. It's it's pretty unique. It looks it almost reminds me of one of those uh almost like an Afghan short sword. Uh one of those uh yeah. Yeah, it, it's, it's really cool. It's the same profile that I was showing earlier with this one. Yeah. Um and then I have a um I'll get your opinion on this. I've got a um another version of it um with Damascus Ooh. that I was thinking about doing like a swedge on it. Um, like a harpoon clip just uh, because why not? Yes. Right. Yes. Like, <laughs> yes, I like that. Um, and, and I, I, uh, I actually don't like harpoons often. Um, a harpoon's gotta be done right. That I like, that's like a swedge on a buoy almost. Um, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I, I like that. Um, you, yeah. I, yeah. We'll, we'll see about that. And you could actually use that, uh, you know, swedge, uh, if it were a thicker steel, you could you could zero grind that and have it be a little bone breaker, you know, on the back of the blade. But you could you, that, you that could might be a little gimmicky. At, you could even use it at you know as a scoop as you're cutting some vegetables and just kind of scoop it up. But, oh, yeah, you know, yeah. I'm I'm working with a um, um, a local woodworker here to custom design me a um, my own cutting board based on my specs. And one of the things is is it's going to have um, like a juice groove. Mm -hmm. almost all the way around. There's going to be about six inches or so in the front middle where there isn't. Um, and right underneath where that is, because I want it to be flush all the way to the edge. And right underneath where that is, it will slide out a little plate made of the same wood. So as you chop your vegetables, you don't have to scoop them on uh, your knife. Uh, that's cool. Yeah. You can just scoop them onto the little plate and it slides right off the cutting board. Take that over, dump it in the pan and then move on. I love so, it. Well, that's we'll cool. See. I'll be sure to post that one on Instagram once I get it. He's he's working on it now. I was gonna say you better patent that sucker right quick. <laughs> uh show us the the Batman and Joker knives. These uh yeah, these so, are these are ones like, that really uh, caught my eye first time. Yeah, like like I mentioned, I uh, I'll start with Batman. Um I I've always liked comic books, I like comic book movies. I'm you know kind of a sucker for that, and um I like to do themes on knives, and so I was able to get a Batman pin. Um, and uh, let's see if I can focus that here a little oh, better. Yeah. Um, but I went with some uh, um, Buckeye here and it's got, you know, yellow liners down the, the spine, the yellow pin. And I had it lasered in where it said, I am vengeance. <laughs> right. Um, and so this the was, it's last it's, thing it's the cucumber pair. sees before you go to town on it. That's right. And so what's a Batman knife without, 
a joker knife. And so this top one is my eight inch chef knife. The bottom one is my six inch petty knife. And it's kind of hard to see. There's some great photos out on my Instagram, but there is a little tiny joker face. Yeah. In there. yeah and I actually see. had this one designed um, specifically um, for, it was for another project I was working on. I, I made a knife uh, that I donated for um, that bass drop show and they had given me the materials and they gave me purple and green. And I actually love purple and green as a color combo. Like I even yeah. have another one here. Ooh. I think it's a great color combo. Um, and so when I see purple and green, my first thought is, you know, Joker or Incredible Hulk. And so I saw that and I went, I got to have a Joker knife. And so I had a pen made up. But the Joker says, why so serious? Oh, nice. So Wait, what? You said, that to, your, you said that to your six inch what knife? Six you, inch petty knife. Petty. What does so, that mean? So a petty is is more of a um, think of it like a large uh, utility knife, or oh. you know a little bit bigger than say. So like here would be a paring knife, mm -hmm. right? Like a four inch paring knife, six inch. So you might do those in a three piece set, right? I think of paring knives as I'm working off the table, right? I'm peeling something, I'm doing something like yeah. that. Um, what I tell folks is that the six inch petty knife, you know, if if you haven't if you don't know like what it is that, that, yeah, that you're you know wanting for a knife, I said, you know, start with a six inch petty knife because that can be your go-to knife um, in the kitchen. And it is for me, if I'm, you know, um, want to cut up an avocado, it's got the right size. I can work it off the table, cut all the way around. I can use this with a little force, mm -hmm. get that nut that's in there, twist it out. Um, if I'm um, making a, a salad for, for just myself or my wife and I, or if I'm doing something where it's just, you know, something for the two of us, I'm cutting something up. This is absolutely perfect. This is all I need. Um, if you're somebody that grips this way, right. Instead of a pinch grip, this is going to be a better knife for you because by gripping it back here, you've moved your hand away from the tip. So that's why when I ask a lot of people, what's your favorite knife in your set? They're like, oh, it's the Santoku or it's the little mini chef knife. So think of this as like a little mini chef knife. Yeah. Um, and that whereas, you know, that that eight inch, I, I say that the eight inch chef knife is I'm preparing a meal for a family. Mm -hmm. Right. I've got my whole family over. I got some friends coming over. I'm going to prepare a meal or I use a pinch grip and I'm very comfortable with it because when you get the closer you can get your hand to the tip the more control you're going to have over that tip for doing something like, um, you know, when you're, when you're slicing onions and, and dicing onions and you've got to get in there and do, you know, a couple little cuts before you then come in sideways and then start slicing them up. Uh, you can, um, uh, I, I, well, not you can, I, I think I can see myself getting a petty knife. Uh, I have plenty of 10 inch and eight inch chef's knives. Um, and my wife likes a little bit of a smaller knife, but, um, uh, I could see that six inch being perfect. Uh, like you said, yeah, hmm. <laughs> huh. it, it, yeah it's, it's a, it's, it's the, um, it's, it's, like I said, it's the go, to, it's my go-to knife in the kitchen. But, but, uh, okay. Uh, but pinpointing it, like when I see that six inch utility knife in a kitchen knife, it's never anything that has any knuckle clearance. It's just like an extra right. long, it's, a low, it's kind of useless right. almost. Yeah. It's um that one, you know, might work for, you know, not even really slicing, like maybe cutting a sandwich in half. I don't know. Right. Um, <laughs> right. That that little utility knife. Um, but yeah, this has got a little bit yeah. of that clearance. Um, so I, yeah, I absolutely love these little six inch, um, and they, they they sell pretty well. So, so that, what, or I tell folks to go with a Santoku, which is a seven inch. So it's kind of like an in between. And that's that one with the gentle belly and the yeah, that's yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's it's got a little bit of curve. The points lower. Um, this is one that you could use with a push cut or a rock. Um, and, um, it's kind of, you know, the, 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 the best of a couple of different worlds, right? If you're only going to get one knife, the Santoku or the Petty, you know, typically might be where you start and then <clears throat> move into, um, a chef knife and then maybe a pairing knife and that, then you start getting into your specialty knives, like your Nikiris, because you like to do a push cut, um, you know, serrated bread knives, um, a fillet knife, a boning knife, um, you know, that all depends upon what you prep and what you eat. If you eat a lot of fish, you eat a lot of chicken, you're filleting chicken breast, a fillet knife works great for that. Yeah. If you do a lot of barbecue, you might want, you know, a, a bigger um, slicer or carving knife um, to cut that up. Well, 
Okay, so what uh, what knives do you want to see yourself making in the future? What how, how do you want to see your <laughs> making as a maker, as a craftsman evolve? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I try to think about that at the beginning of every year. And I try to set myself a couple of goals. Um, and one of the ones that I had for this year was to um, do serrations. And so in 2023, I, I made probably half a dozen knives and a fillet knife. Um, I made um, fillet knives and I got that heat treat down where I could um, trust it and, and really flex it and learned how to control the grind to get the flex in the right place. Um, and then I also did some serrated um, bread knives or sandwich knives. And so that was my goal for last year. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that I also had on the list that I only really attempted once um, was to do what's called an S grind. And so if you think of an S grind, it's, it's a compound grind on a knife, a chef knife that's got a tall heel um, and it's really meant for food release. And so if you think of like a normal chef knife full flat all the way up, the S grind is going to go up maybe about three quarters of an inch. And then it's going to hollow with a, I mean, we're talking a big, like, you know, you're not using like a contact wheel, like you're, you have a rate, you know, a radius platen. And so it's the equivalent of grinding on like, say a 72 inch wheel. Oh, wow. Okay. Right. Yeah. And so it gets this subtle hollow. So it goes up and then in up to the spine. So you think about it's kind of like an S, right? And so it so releases that, that's something. Sorry. Yeah. It, it gives a little bit of a gap, right? For some of that food to kind of come off. Um, it can also lighten a blade even further. Um, so you may be able to work with a little bit thicker material when you're getting that taller heel. And it, it takes off some of that weight um, and, and really, um, does that so like i said i made one that was a nakiri um i also messed up a couple of others that uh, ended up in my oops pile all good knife makers should have an oops pile and they should also revisit it once a year because you learn more and more about you know your craft and somebody had told me once before that the what separates a um a good knife maker from a great knife maker, right? Or a master knife maker. Um, one of the things is, is as you get better, you learn how to fix your mistakes. Um, you could say hide mistakes, like cosmetically, like obviously you can't hide a functional mistake, um, but you, you learn how to fix mistakes more than anything. So maybe you have one that has a little bit of a warp in it or something you can come back and, um, you know, learn learn how to fix that. Right. And so go to your oops pile ever so often, find one, um, practice on it, use it, you know, um, grind it thinner, grind it thinner than you ever thought you, you could. And you know what, if you mess it up, it was, it was trash anyway. Yeah. And maybe it'll come out of the oops pile. If you grind and it all might it. come out of the oops, might yeah. come out of the oops pile would make a great gift for somebody. Yeah. I've had some that I've salvaged from the oops pile that then I was able to fix well enough to where I felt comfortable selling it. It's like I'm good good enough now to grind away the suck and there's and release the great blade within. Yes. I, so I as, wasn't in the right mindset there or had the right skills, but I do now. Yeah. Uh as we wrap here, Chris, uh tell us what your goals are for Steel Dog Knives as a company uh moving forward. <laughs> yeah, I tell people that um I'm I'm training myself for my retirement job. Um, I've got one kid in college right now, um, who's, um, studying to go into hotel restaurant management. So that's mm. kind of cool. Yeah. Um, I've got, um, another in high school who's thinking about going into, um, nutritional science. Mm. So when we think about, you know, both of them, here we are around food, right. Coming together as families. And so it's, it's really cool. My, my daughter in high school is taking a culinary class next year. I don't think they'll let her bring her own custom knife, but she does have <laughs> a couple. Um, but no, what am I, what do I think about? Like, I want to continue to get better and continue to improve, learn new things, push myself to where at some point when I decide that, you know, I've had enough of, uh, you know, my, my regular day job, you know, I'm at a point, my kids are out of college, you know, and it, it's time to retire. Mm -hmm. I have something that will keep me busy, something that will keep me passionate, something that allows me a creative outlet. Um, 
and keeps me occupied, but keeps me tied in with this wonderful knife making community. Um, I absolutely love it. I've made friends in this knife making community that I see as, as, as brothers and sisters and, and I'll, you know, I, I know that we'll be friends uh, for the rest of our lives. Right. Um, and so it, 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 that means a lot to me. And so I want to stay connected in that, but I don't see like going full time. Um, and, um, I, like I said, I, I think, um, I like, I like my day job too. So, um, I want to kind of balance both. And then at some point it's, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do these and I'll, I'll make, you know, however much I need to make sure that I'm, I'm happy. Right. Well, that's a, that's a good second bit of advice. Your first being, uh, you know, go back to your oops pile that, uh, that's a scalable advice that you could give to anyone, not just knife makers, uh, go back to your old work, check it out, see how you've improved and see what you can do better. But also like, uh, aiming for that retirement but not just thinking oh i think i might do this i might do that but have it humming along by the time you get there it's well underway and you already have something thriving chris jones steel dog knives i want to thank you so much for coming on the knife junkie podcast it's been great uh, catching up with you after meeting you uh, down in texas yeah absolutely thanks for having me this was a blast uh my pleasure take care sir Mm -hmm. The Get Upside app is your way to get cash back on your gas purchases. Get Upside is an app you put on your smartphone, and whenever you need to get gas, search your area for savings, claim your discount, fill up your tank, and then take a picture of the receipt with your phone. And that's it. You've just got cash back. Visit theknifejunkie.com forward slash save on gas to get the app and start saving. Again, that's theknifejunkie.com slash save on gas. There he goes, ladies and gentlemen, Chris Jones of Steel Dog Knives. Uh, forgot to mention before, you can catch up with him on his website, uh, uh, steeldogknives.square.com, uh, I believe. Jim had it up on the screen, but also check out his Instagram. Beautiful pictures, and uh, I do believe that's the best way to reach out uh, to him to get your hands, uh, get, your, get your mitts on one of his beautiful knives. All right, for Jim, working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Podcast.